This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. Lectures in History joins students in the classroom to hear lectures on campuses across the country on topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9/11. This week, James Madison University professor Andrew Whitmer teaches a class about the evolution of rural areas after the Civil War. Good afternoon. Welcome to class. Our topic today is small town Maine and the world. The year is 1872, and the little town of Monson, in central Maine, has a big problem. The town has bounced back from the fire that swept through its downtown, destroying many of the buildings in 1860. And it's recovering from the trauma of the American Civil War. The Civil War ended just seven years earlier, in 1865. More than 10 percent of townspeople served in the Civil War, and at least six of them died. The problem, even as the town of Monson celebrates the 50th anniversary of its founding. Is that so many of its young people are moving away? In the census of 1870, Monson was listed as having 604 residents. 604. Out of curiosity, how many of you are from places with more than 604 residents? Show of hands. Virtually everyone. How many of you went to high school? With more than 604 people, again, virtually everyone. Monson was a tiny place, and that meant that every departure, every person who moved away from home, hurt. Their absence was noted. In 1872, when townspeople gathered to celebrate turning 50, the speaker at the event tried to put a good spin on things, but he admitted, "quote." This constant emigration of our citizens, and especially of the young, seems discouraging. It's worth noting that this problem was not new. In New England, young people had been moving away from home for centuries. In settled parts of New England. Often, if you were not the child who inherited the family farm, you had to move away to find land. And the frontier of Maine was becoming one of the places that people moved to. This map is from about 1820. I've marked the location of Monson, Maine, with a star, and I love this map in part because it shows. Just how little was known about the interior of Maine in 1820. Monson would be founded there two years after this map was created. There's plenty of information about coastal Maine, but virtually nothing about the interior of the state. This was truly the nation's northern frontier in 1820. Monson's founders were part of a tidal wave of movement. In the first half of the 1800s, during the first half of the 1800s, almost half of all Americans crossed state boundaries to change residence. Almost half of all Americans crossed state boundaries to change residence. This was one of, if not the most mobile period in American history. In previous classes, we've talked about the majority of settlers who headed west, but a smaller group moved onto the northern frontier. Monson was founded in 1822 by settlers from Massachusetts and southern Maine, who came pushing north into the ancestral homeland of the Wabanaki people. And this map shows you the division of that land. Wabanaki land into townships. So I'll point out a couple things. You can see Monson circled on the left 
It's been divided between two educational institutions, two schools, Hebron Academy and Monson Academy. Hebron Academy was located in Hebron, Maine, southern Maine, and Monson Academy in Monson, Massachusetts. And perhaps you'll note some of the other ed educational institutions who have been given, granted by the legislature, townships. Bowdoin College, Williams College, the Massachusetts Medical Society. This was a common practice. The legislature would grant townships, would grant land on the frontier to educational institutions or philanthropic societies. They could then sell off that land to individual settlers and use the proceeds to pay their expenses. Also note how close Monson is to the center of the state of Maine. And you can see at the very top of the map the efforts of the state of Maine to fix the Wabanaki people in place on land reserved for Indians. Now, let's fast forward 50 years back to 1872, where we started. Monson existed because people had been willing to pick up roots and relocate. Now, in 1872, the town was concerned because so many of its residents were leaving home. And Monson was not alone. Many rural places throughout the United States were confronting the same problem. Some rural people were moving west into the far west or midwest in search of better farmland. So rural people moving to new rural areas but others were leaving rural life entirely. This was a trend that had gained steam in the 1840s and never stopped. You're looking here at census data from the US Census Bureau. And this data shows us some important things about American life in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I want to get your thoughts about what stands out in this census information. What's noteworthy? Who has some comments about what this shows us about American life? Yes, Lexa, please. Um, there's a very direct linear trend that as more people move from rural to urban, um, Every 10 years, it seems to be twofold. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, Izzy. Uh, so the trend that I notice is that it actually starts to show the Industrial Revolution in uh, the United States. So it kind of shows the increase of a middle class because when you become a middle class citizen, they typically move towards more urban areas. Um, so you can see that as rural decreases, urban increases, which kind of shows the rise of probably jobs increasing in those urban areas um, and this the lack of need to work on farms. Excellent. Thank you. Let me just highlight a couple things, and thank you for those good comments. One, until 1920, most Americans were rural people. They lived in the countryside. So if you want to understand the 19th century American experience, you have to understand the rural experience. But as was just pointed out, a big part of that experience is the steady movement of people into the city. Now, actually, in hard numbers, rural population was increasing. But you can see that rural people as a percentage of overall American population is declining. And it's declining decade by decade by decade. We also know that many rural people, especially ambitious young people, were moving to the cities. Historians of the Midwest have described a pipeline from the farms to the cities by the end of the 1800s. I should note that rural was defined by the US Census Bureau during this time. 
as any place with fewer than 2,500 residents. So these were truly small places, places like Monson, Maine. This could be terribly hard for the people who remained behind. Just think about it. It's hard enough living in a college town like Harrisonburg, where every year people that you care about graduate and leave and don't come back. How rude. How thoughtless. But at least here, thousands of new people show up every year to replace you. Not that they can, but here they come every year. Imagine what it would be like if every year the seniors graduated and went away and no freshman ever came to take your place. One historian has argued that population loss, especially the loss of young people to cities or to the West, raised fears among some rural Easterners that not just their town, but their way of life was fading. It was clear that cities were increasingly culturally powerful in shaping tastes and fashions and values. Additionally, over the previous few decades, the differences between the city and the country and the differences between city people and country people had been increasing. So let me just give you one way in which this takes place. Urban historians have shown that during the years before the Civil War, there were many animals and significant agriculture in major American cities. For example, in 1820, there were an estimated, by one estimate, 20,000 hogs living in the settled portions of Manhattan. 20,000 hogs roaming the streets of Manhattan. That's one hog for every five people. And this was the case, hogs roaming through the streets of the city, rooting freely, until in the middle decades of the 19th century, middle-class gentrifiers began to restrict urban agriculture in the name of public health. Last week, we studied the rising wealth and the growing inequalities of the Gilded Age, the last few decades of the 1800s. As the United States industrialized on a grand scale after the Civil War, cities amassed more power and more economic clout. They became economic hubs. For example, rural people could now buy urban goods through the mail. Last week, on Sunday afternoon, I ordered two books on Amazon, and they showed up at my doorstep the next day. It was almost as if Jeff Bezos was standing outside my house just ready to give me whatever I ask. That's impressive, but it's worth noting that Sears got there first. Based in Chicago, you could order by mail an incredible variety of merchandise from the city that made its way into the country. Some urban people, struck by the economic clout of Chicago and New York, compared their relationship with rural areas to the relationship between an imperial capital and its colonies. City people, many of them, by the way, born and raised in the countryside, began to popularize negative stereotypes of country people, some stereotypes that we still recognize today. Here's a cartoon that was published in a New York City magazine in 1890. It imagines what would be the case if rural people elected a country person as president of the United States. We talked last week about the growing political activity of people in the countryside, the Farmers' Alliance, the Populist Party. What negative stereotypes of country people do you see in this image? What do you notice? 
Tiffany? I mean, they don't look like really refined. Like on the top, you can see a guy whittling a stick. His like feet are up on the table. Um, I mean, we don't exactly picture that as professional now, so I can't imagine they would have thought that it was professional back then. These people are not fit to wield political power, yet here they are. And the caption reads, the great political future of the farmer, a glance ahead to the time when the hayseed runs the government. Has anyone ever heard the slur hayseed used for a rural person? This term, this insult for a country person, was coined, as far as we know, in 1851 in the novel Moby Dick. Who's the author of the novel Moby, Moby Dick? Anyone know? Herman Melville. Herman Melville, <laughs> thank you. And where is he from? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> New York City. Herman Melville, New York City, Hayseed. A provincial, a rustic. Urban people had so many put-downs they could use to mock rural people. So we know of a couple others that have been used for centuries. Bumpkin, Hick. Urban Americans began to use Hick, a noun, as an adjective as well, as in, that guy is from a Hick town. And they invented a new insult for country people, rube, during the 1800s. But it went both ways. Last week, when we talked about the populist movement, I showed you this cartoon. Country people fought back with their own stereotypes about city people. You can see it happening in this cartoon, where the populist movement warned that urban fat cats were exploiting hardworking country people. Country people also came up with insulting nicknames for city people. We still use some of them today. If I were to ask you, what's the name of someone from the city who goes out into the countryside and sticks out like a sore thumb, doesn't have the knowledge or the skills to survive in the country? What would you call that kind of a person, Is he? No, just city a city slicker. That's exactly right. That term, that insult for urban folks, was first used, that we know, in Indiana in the early 1900s. Many Americans of this time thought of urban-rural as a dichotomy, fundamentally different and even competing things. And we still do often, don't we? Here's a cartoon from just a few years ago that is quite similar to the populist cartoon I just showed you. Urban California is depicted as elitist, demanding, grabby. Give unto us your water, your bountiful harvest exploiting the hard work of farmers and other rural people. Our political conflicts in the United States today often seem to map onto the urban-rural divide. This is familiar, right? Red state, Republican, associated with its own distinctive rural way of life, its own culture, opposing blue state, democratic America with its own distinctive urban culture. And we know from recent survey data that many Americans, whether in the country or the city, feel misunderstood or disliked by people from other kinds of places. So here's survey data from the Pew Research Center and it says that 63% of urban Americans feel that their communities are looked down on 
and misunderstood by people in other types of communities. The same is true for 56% of rural people. And suburbanites don't feel as looked down upon or misunderstood. 70% of rural people say that most people who don't live in the same type of community as them don't understand the problems that they face. In light of all this, you might think that rural people always responded negatively and defensively to the growing power of cities. Differences were multiplying. There was resentment and distrust. But in the rest of today's class, I want to show you another aspect of the relationship between city and countryside in the late 19th century. Historians have shown that it is misleading to only focus on the tensions and the conflict. There was also a symbiotic relationship between city and countryside. We see that, for example, in this book by the historian William Cronin, which explored how Chicago and many Western rural places remade themselves by working together to produce globally desirable commodities like grain, lumber, and meat. So as cities grew, sparking concerns about rural depopulation and the decline of a rural way of life, many rural people realized that cities might help them solve their problems. Looking at all of those census numbers that I showed you earlier might seem to suggest that decline in the countryside was inevitable. Decade by decade, cities rise, rural places fade. But as you know, in this course, we are trying throughout American history, to read history forward. In hindsight, most developments seem inevitable, right? Because they happened. But when we step back into the shoes of rural people in 1870 or 1900, when we read what they wrote and try to see the world through their eyes, we often find a surprising degree of optimism about their ability to use urban resources for their own purposes. And this actually moved beyond the rural-urban division to work across other supposed oppositions, such as local and global. Rural people often drew creatively on outside resources of all kinds to strengthen local, rural places. They learned how to weave the fabric of locality from imported as well as indigenous materials. Now, we could look in many places to see this happening, but I want to focus on how it all played out in the small town where we began today of Monson, Maine. Why Monson? Good question. A few more people lived in Chicago than in Monson, but until 1920, more people lived in places like Monson than in places like Chicago. Still, there were thousands of small towns across the United States. Why this particular small town? The short answer is that I care personally much more about this particular small town than I do about those thousands of other small towns. There's nothing very special about Monson, Maine from an academic point of view, which is actually helpful for studying broader developments in American rural life, 
This was not an unusual place, so it can open a window into changes in other similar small rural places. But for me, there's a lot that's special about Monson from a personal point of view because this is the place where I spent the first 18 years of my life. This is my hometown. Included in this 1889 lithograph, this bird's eye view of Monson, are the house where I grew up, the church on Main Street that my father pastored, the lake where I learned how to swim, not very well. I failed swim lessons. That's another story. The shop where my brothers and I bought penny candy. And the hill where I went camping with my parents and where they now live. I know the mean streets of Monson from firsthand experience. <laughs> yep. That's me in the center on the bike that I got for my birthday. And no, you are not seeing double. On the right is my identical twin brother on his identical bike, <laughs> dressed identically, and also badly in need of a haircut. This is the view from the house where my parents now live on Homer Hill where we used to cut down Christmas trees and go camping in the summer. And this is the view of my parents' thermometer one cold winter morning, which maybe helps to explain why so few people live in Monson. It's very cold in the winter. Has anyone ever heard of Monson? Nope. <laughs> Didn't think so. Once in a great while... I'll mention my hometown, and someone will say, I know it. I've been there. And it's almost always because of this. Monson is on the Appalachian Trail. It's at the beginning or the end, depending on whether you're hiking north or south, of the 100-mile wilderness, which is the last 100 miles of the trail before you get to Mount Katahdin. And many, many hikers come through Monson. People send them packages that they pick up at the post office, or they stock up, take a much-needed shower, and prepare for the final push or recuperate from just having hiked the 100-mile wilderness. Just this summer, a friend of mine spent a day or two in Monson as he section hiked the Appalachian Trail. I love this town. I love Monson. But like all those young people who were leaving Monson and other rural places in 1872, I moved away when I turned 18, and I never moved back. Many of my friends also left town. Like other rural places in central Maine and throughout the United States, Monson has faced hard times. The furniture mill shut down. That was the backbone of the town's economy. Many jobs were lost. The elementary school, where I attended kindergarten through fifth grade, closed. In 2000, the Census Bureau reported that the official population of Monson was 666 residents. 600. 66 residents, 666. Six, six. That is not an auspicious number. At, at that point, I think someone really needs to take one for the team and just move away from town or persuade a friend to come move in with them so that you have 665 or 667 residents, but not 666. For a long time, as I studied history in graduate school, and then began teaching and writing history here at JMU. I enjoyed visiting Monson in the summer, but I didn't think much about the history of the place that I was from. And then a few years ago, I began to realize that many of the things I study as an historian, for example, the relationship between the United States 
and the wider world, and the way that places and identities are formed through global interactions, many of those things that I study as an historian played out here in this place that I was from. So I began to dream of writing a history of my hometown that would explore how rural places like Monson often forged locality, not by isolating themselves from the wider world, but by creatively engaging it. Long story short, that's the book that I'm currently writing. And fortunately for me, the town has always had people who cared about its history and worked hard to preserve it. Here's the Monson Historical Society, which has allowed me to work with its wonderful collections. I was there doing research a couple years ago in the summer, and they literally gave me the key to the Historical Society so I could come and go as I wished. Local historians like Glenn Poole and Tootie Bennett have worked for years to preserve the town's history, and they've been incredibly generous to me in sharing documents and photographs, including many of the photographs that I'll show you in just a bit, in offering research advice and guidance and support. I want to draw on that research now to examine four ways that the people of this rural place responded to the problem that I talked about at the very beginning of class. Their town was declining, And they rejuvenated it in the late 1800s by tapping urban and even global resources. So over the next few minutes, we are going to look together at Monson's creation of an industrial landscape, a tourist landscape, the creation of a new local newspaper called the Weekly Slate, and at rural immigration. First of all, an industrial landscape. We talked about industrialization last week when we explored the Gilded Age. Between 1870 and 1900, as the United States industrialized on a grand scale, the value of manufactured products quadrupled. The United States passed a significant milestone in 1890 because in 1890, for the first time in American history, the value of manufactured goods passed the value of agricultural products. We spent some time last week in discussion section exploring some of the industrial activity that took place in cities like Chicago. Think of Jurgis and other immigrants working in the meatpacking factories of Chicago. Rural places sometimes industrialized as well. For example, small towns in the Midwest opened canning factories, usually staffed by local farm women, that canned local produce, sweet corn, peas, tomatoes. That's a form of rural industrialization. These images from Monson reveal some of the ways that Monson's landscape was altering as the nation industrialized. So here's some economic activity. Can you see it? Can you tell what it is? Upper left, if you look at the upper left part of that upper left image, you can see the existence of logging. This was always an important source of additional income for people in Monson, farmers and others. They would cut trees. They would float them across Lake Hebron through the canal. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a lumber mill where they can saw them into boards. There's a railroad. I'll talk in just a moment about why Monson gets a railroad in the 1880s. And then there's some big activity going on in that bottom image. This is really the heart of the creation of Monson's industrial landscape. 
And it has to do with the discovery that Monson had something that the rest of the nation, even other parts of the world, desired. And here it is. Here's the thing that Monson had that other places wanted. Can you tell what that is? What material was used to create this cutout of the state of Maine? Any idea? Uh, something hard. Something hard. Excellent. Very, very good. Paul, how about you? Can you tell what that is? It's a kind of stone. Is it slate? Perfect. Slate. You can pass that around. That is Monson's slate that was cut into the shape of Maine. Monson found that it had something very valuable, and it was willing to work hard to dig it out of the ground and ship it out on its new railroad to the rest of the world. Running through Monson are two veins of very high-quality black slate, blue-black slate. The vein pictured on the bottom image runs straight through town from Lake Hebron to Monson Pond, literally crossing under Main Street. Now, townspeople in Monson have often talked about slate being discovered in 1870. The town's Wikipedia page talks about the discovery of slate in 1870. So I was surprised to learn in my research that townspeople actually knew long before 1870 about the existence of slate in their area. For example, in 1820, this is two years before the town was officially incorporated, a few settlers built a slate chimney with slate that they found lying around on the ground. And they said that it worked about as well as a brick chimney. From early on, some townspeople buried their dead beneath slate markers in the town's first churchyard cemetery. You can see a couple of those markers close to the foreground of this photograph. In 1860s, surveyors for the state of Maine passed through Monson, and they reported in their official report that there was high-quality slate that could be profitably quarried. So what happened in 1870 was not the result of the discovery of slate. The creation of Monson's rural industrial landscape was not the result of the discovery of slate. Many people knew it was there, but it didn't have much value to them until national and global developments made it possible to quarry slate profitably in rural central Maine. If you were buying slate in the late 19th century, what were you going to do with it? Any guesses? What do you use slate for in the late 1800s? You guys aren't in the slate market? No one's trying to buy slate? Mia? Yeah, if you would. Possibly, possibly blackboards in schools? Yes. That is one of the main uses later in the 1800s, early 1900s, blackboards in schools. But the main use was roofing. If you were buying slate in the late 1800s, you probably intended to use it to shingle a building, your home or your church or a courthouse or some other public building. Why? Because slate shingles were fire resistant and they lasted longer than wood shingles. But they were also expensive and therefore quite rare in the United States. Before the Civil War, most people who could afford to buy slate shingles bought it from quarries in Wales or in England. It was often shipped as ballast in the holds of ships from England or Wales. Three changes during the middle decades of the 19th century created demand for Monson slate. So here very quickly are three changes in the middle decades of the 1800s that created demand and led Monson people 
to begin digging up slate and shipping it out of their town. First of all, development of the railroad network in the United States. This made it possible to profitably ship heavy stone over long distances. Development of the railroad network. As part of this, conversion to steel rails, thank you, Andrew Carnegie, conversion to steel rails allowed people to use larger locomotives that could haul heavier loads. So that's the first factor, the development of the rail network. Second factor was new building styles. The new styles that caught on across the United States featured steeper roofs, and they worked better with slate shingles. They were also more visible from the street. And so because they were visible from the street, design experts began to praise slate as a roofing material. They liked how it looked. Some builders, like the builder of this Vermont house, constructed in 1885, even began to arrange slate shingles into multicolored, ornate patterns. The third factor was Welsh immigration. Welsh immigrants from slate quarrying regions of Wales began to move in large numbers to the United States. Dozens of them moved to Monson. And Welsh immigrants dramatically improved American quarries. So the growth of Monson's quarries was part of a much larger development. A larger development in which Americans fought their way into an established market, into an established industry, and grabbed control from English and Welsh quarries of the American slate market. Monson had a kind of crazy first decade with slate. The quarries opened in 1870, and there was something that sounds to me, reading the documents, like a slate rush for the first decade. Local people were buying and selling land. Fortunes were won and lost. And then in 1880, after it was clear that there was a lot of slate here and it was very high quality and there was demand for it, outside investors from Massachusetts came to town and they bought up the quarries and they began to operate the quarries. These investors opened new markets for Monson Slate in the West, and they connected the town to the nearest railroad line with a little narrow-gauge railroad, I showed it to you earlier, that opened in 1883. The quarries brought hundreds of new jobs to this small town in central Maine. And those jobs attracted many new people. Here are some of the workers in Monson's slate quarries. The work that they were doing was quite dangerous. The quarries descended hundreds of feet into the ground. This is actually the same photograph I've zoomed in on the right so that you can glimpse the men at the bottom of this vast pit. You can hardly see them in the photograph on the left. Here are images of men ascending and descending to the bottom of the slate quarries. Note how they get up and down in these little rickety looking wooden boxes. This is dangerous work. The local newspaper is filled with accounts of people injured in blasts, of massive chunks of slate falling onto men and injuring them or crushing them. The blasting method that was used in Monson's slate quarries produced a massive amount of waste. Much of that waste is visible to this day in mountains of jagged slate that rise around the rims of old abandoned slate quarries. With permission from the state of Maine, the quarries also dumped some of their waste into Lake Hebron, helping to form this peninsula, 
Where I played when I was a kid, we used to call it Slate Point. I've skipped Slate on Lake Hebron with my grandfather out at the end of Slate Point. And more recently, I've skipped Slate on Lake Hebron with my own children. This photograph shows you how large the quarries got. This is the old Kineo Quarry. And I know this place, too, because on Saturdays when I was growing up, we would get into the car, drive down to the edge of this quarry, which by that time was long abandoned, take our trash out of the trunk of the car, and throw it over the edge. When I was growing up, this was the town dump, believe it or not. And it continued to be until I left for college and someone realized, probably not a good idea, and began to haul Monson's trash away. As the pits deepened, Monson's slate began to appear on the roofs of Harvard Law School, New England prisons and cathedrals, a New York courthouse, and countless other buildings across the country. Slate quarries were soon Monson's largest employer. The town was reinventing itself by drawing on outside capital to profit from an industry that had recently been dominated by British quarries. That's the creation of a rural industrial landscape. But even as the quarries blasted and burrowed deeper and deeper, shipping off slate to the cities, urban people themselves began to arrive in Monson, usually during the summer months. And those city people were looking for a very different kind of rural landscape, one that in many ways was at odds with the industrial landscape. For most Americans, taking a vacation was still a relatively new experience. The middle class, we've talked about them, had begun to embrace the practice of taking a vacation just during the 1850s. And soon businesses were giving their brain workers, their white-collar workers, one week of paid vacation during the summer. City people often saw rural vacations as a chance to get away from the heat and the congestion, the noise, the stress of the city, and to reconnect with nature. So every summer, crowds of urban middle-class vacationers left on the railroads, for rural destinations, places like White Sulphur Springs in the south, West Virginia, or Lake Tahoe in the west, or the Hudson Valley in New York. As the nation's railroad network quadrupled in size between 1865 and 1890, vacationers could travel further and further afield. You had a week But if you could travel by railroad, maybe you could make it to a more distant location and enjoy your time away. This was part of the process by which coastal Maine became a tourist mecca. And gradually, people began to find their way even into the center of the state of Maine, to a place called Moosehead Lake. Moosehead Lake is one of the largest lakes within the bounds of of one state in the country. And it is located just 15 or 20 minutes north of Monson. It was actually on that map that I showed you, the one without any detail in the center of Maine. All they said was something like, a large lake has been discovered here. Well, that was Moosehead Lake. And it became a major tourist destination with big city tourists from places like Boston making their way during the summertime. Railroad companies realized that more urban vacationers meant more paying passengers. So railroad companies became some of the big vacation promoters. They released eye-catching travel guides and brochures. There was lots of money to be made. One person called 
big city vacationers the crop from the city. Every year, the crop from the city. With the right approach, even quiet and out-of-the-way places like Monson might be able to get in on the rural tourism boom. There were some requirements, though. One was easy transportation. People had to be able to get there easily and quickly. Massachusetts investors helped with that by connecting the town to the railroad network. Monson people got into the act as well. They voted in a town meeting to use town funds to improve the roads for bicyclists like these people and for carriage riders hoping to move through the countryside and enjoy the scenery. Outside investors also constructed a place to stay. This was another requirement. In 1882, investors built Monson's beautiful new Lake Hebron Hotel. So there needs to be easy travel. You need good lodging and good roads. But the most important requirement was what we might call placemaking. Placemaking. Defining and marketing your rural place as the kind of place where urban vacationers might enjoy visiting. For that crucial task, Monson people turned to a railroad publicist. His name was George Haynes, who had already mastered the formula. George Haynes was a publicist for the railroad, and over just five years or so, he cranked out nearly 20 promotional guides touting small places as good vacation destinations. Here's the brochure that he created for Monson. This was published in 1889, and it was designed to lure city people onto railroad cars and into the middle of Maine to spend their week of vacation in Monson. Now, how do you do that? Let's think about it. If you are a railroad publicist in 1889, what do you say about Monson or any other isolated rural place to make it seem appealing to city people? I'd like to get your thoughts. What do you think? If you're a publicist in the late 1880s, what do you emphasize about a quiet, rural place. Tiffany? I mean, like they did, I would emphasize something that's really unique to the place that they're visiting, so like the slate, um, and also just emphasize that it's beautiful and you connect back to nature, and the fact that you can get to it easily, which is what they did with the um, train. Excellent, good. So they're saying you can get here quickly, you've got a week, You won't need to take all of it up traveling. There's something to see once you get here, the slate quarries, and it's beautiful. What else? What kind of adjectives would you want to use? Kierna? Well, I was going to say that you could emphasize the lake um, because... uh, you know, water is pretty cool, and like you know, being in the city, there's like you know, there's yeah. not like a lake around. Uh, I also thought what was interesting up there at the top it says, "The Switzerland of Maine." Is that because of the temperature, or I think it's because of the beauty of the landscape. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So the lake, the water. What would you do? You could swim, you could fish. It's beautiful. It's the Switzerland of Maine. This is a place where you can breathe mountain air. You can be rejuvenated. You're escaping the sooty, industrialized, polluted environment of the cities. It's health-giving. All right, we are going to play a little bit of small-town bingo. So these are very good adjectives that you helped to come up with. I want you to listen and see how many of the qualities that were just mentioned by Kiernan and Tiffany are used in George Haynes's actual pamphlet, Advertising Monson. So I'm just going to read a couple selections. Monson, the beautiful, is a charming locality nestled between high hills. It has within its borders 25 lakelets 
with picturesque surroundings. The scenery, as viewed from this lake, is very beautiful. As a place for summer recreation, for riding, walking, boating, bathing or swimming, fishing, and hunting sports. Monson has charms which those who know it best most love. It is fast becoming a favorite summer resort to the weary city resident who desires a rest from business and society cares and the oppressive heat of the city. Here the invalid or overworked man of business or letters can quaff the God-given pure mineral waters and breathe the mountain air mingled with the balsam fir and pine that braces them up as no other tonic can and have the opportunity of enjoying a quiet country life over farms and forests, over mountains and lakes. Do you hear the language of rest, relaxation, step out of the rat race, slow down? It's like a step out of the modern world. And what about the people who live there? What about the town itself? Haynes wrote, flower gardens are numerous. Ornamental grounds are often seen and fine cottage homes and villas, just such as one would expect love and happiness to dwell in, are found upon every street. It sounds like a Thomas Kincaid painting, doesn't it? It sounds almost too good to be true. This is a small town depicted as the opposite of the ills of the city. Again, it's like stepping out of modern life with all of its problems and being able to recharge your batteries for a week in the countryside. As Monson created and marketed its tourist landscape, it joined the widespread romanticization of rural life. The very qualities, quietness, relative isolation, that had led many of its young people to leave for the cities could now be emphasized in order to draw city people to the country, even if for only a week. Local people were absolutely involved in this kind of placemaking. The stewards, a family of Monson artists, sold images of the tourist landscape that they painted on canvas, on canoe paddles, and on slate in the bottom left. This is the Monson of the Lake Hebron Hotel, pictured in the upper left, of moose and fish of a quiet, peaceful lake without the noise and din and pollution of the city. And there was absolutely some truth in the Monson created by George Haynes and painted by Seth Stewart. But the qualities that you see here were clearly not the whole truth about Monson or other rural places. Picturing the country as the opposite of the city, as a place to get away from the problems and difficulties of modern life ignored the fact that rural places were complex and changing and part of modern life. And we can see that simply by noting the existence of the industrial landscape. So this image from 1889 features both the tourist landscape, you can see the Lake Hebron Hotel circled near the left, and the boaters out on the lake, but it exists alongside the Monson of chugging railroad cars and the slate quarries and a lumber mill. And there is some tension between the rural tourist landscape and the rural industrial landscape because people from Chicago or Boston, or New York, and they all send summer vacationers to Monson, when they come to the Lake Hebron Hotel, they probably are not very keen on the sound of explosions from the slate quarries. 
the industrial landscape. There is some tension between these two, even though they coexist. All right, let's move on to the third point. Yes, Mia. I was just going to say this reminds me a little bit of the bit about noble savages from a few weeks ago. Like the noble savages just painted as being, um, the Native Americans just painted as being part of nature forever, but not caught up with the modern world. Like, oh, the clocks are raced out of the photographs. That is a very insightful comment. So Mia is reminding us of Edward Curtis and the myth of the vanishing Indian and the way that many Americans romanticized Native Americans, right? They picture Native American way of life as beautiful, the opposite of all of the problems of modern life, but doomed to fade away when it confronts modern life. And we could add to that, Mia, and point that the same thing was done with the pre-Civil War South, which, after the Civil War, was falsely remembered as beautiful, antiquated, unmodern, and doomed to be gone with the wind when it confronted the modern north. So I think it's a very perceptive observation. You can see it with Native Americans. You can see it with the pre-Civil War South. And you can see it with rural places in small towns. As the nation industrializes, as it confronts the problems of modernization, people are looking for something that they can use to imagine an alternative. And often, they romanticize these other groups. And often, even as they're saying that's beautiful and admirable, there's some condescension involved. Thank you for that comment. Now let's talk about the third point, the weekly slate. In June 1885, a stranger walked into this building on Main Street. It was called the Rat Hole, and it was the tiny little law office of John Francis Sprague. Summer of 1885, the stranger was visiting from Bangor. Bangor was a regionally significant city, just about 50 miles from Monson, 50 miles southeast. The stranger represented a printing firm in Bangor that was establishing a line of locally edited small-town newspapers. John Francis Sprague jumped at the chance to serve as the first editor of Monson's first and only newspaper. The town was so small that it could never have supported a newspaper on its own, but it was appealing to join a syndicate run by a big city printer. Soon, the first issue of the Weekly Slate, great name, rolled off the press in Bangor and went on sale in Monson and five neighboring towns. I found the first year's run of the Weekly Slate at the Maine Historical Society in Portland, Maine. This is issue number one. It was definitely a local paper. It advertised itself that way. Look at the masthead, a local newspaper devoted to the interest of the people of northern Piscataquis, that's the county, and vicinity. And it doesn't get much more local than the breaking news at the very top of the fourth column that the other day one of A.P. Hathaway's hens laid an enormous egg. That's a local newspaper, right? The Slate promoted understandings of progress and locality that embraced outside influences. This is one of the key things that I found as I studied the first year's run of this local newspaper. It actually shows us local people debating the meaning of local. What is local? Well, for the slate, for John Francis Sprague, local meant welcoming in outside influences. This was a local newspaper that was owned and printed in a city, Bangor. 
Every issue combined ads and news about Monson and nearby towns with material that was drawn from outside sources. So news from the cities or literature serialized from European sources and writers. We get to glimpse the Slate's view of local very clearly in a war of words between Monson's newspaper and Dover's newspaper called the Piscataquis Observer. Dover was the county seat of Piscataquis County where Monson is located. And for a long time, the Piscataquis Observer based in Dover, was the only newspaper in the county. So it did not look kindly on the larger city of Bangor starting a small-town newspaper within the county in Monson. The Observer, published in Dover, complained that the Slate, its new rival, quote, can hardly be called a local institution inasmuch as it is owned by foreign capital and is wholly printed outside of Piscataquis County. When I first read that, I thought, how interesting. Something published 50 miles away is called foreign because it's owned by people who live outside the county. So here's a very closed and insular understanding of local. If it's outside of the county, it doesn't qualify as local. It's actually foreign. The controversy that continued over the following months shows that John Francis Sprague also saw himself as a champion of the local and that he had a very different conception of local. A newspaper published in Bangor was not for him a foreign threat, but actually a powerful resource for building and promoting his town. John Francis Sprague clearly saw the place-making power of print. Like many others who measured their small towns not primarily against cities, but in comparison to nearby small towns, Sprague saw closer ties with Bangor not as undermining local independence, but as a way of bolstering Monson's position within its county. Dover, which was the county seat and the home of the Piscataquis Observer, Dover was the key rival. Sprague wanted to use his city-published newspaper to bypass Dover and to make Monson an economic and cultural hub for towns in his vicinity. So here you have an urban printer as a resource for a small-town editor who wants to strengthen his position against other small towns. You see something similar happening a few years later when a Boston artist and entrepreneur comes to Monson selling bird's eye views. I've been showing you vignettes from this 1889 bird's eye view of Monson. These were very popular. More than 2,400 communities had bird's eye views made. Local people could pay to have their business numbered on the image and then listed in the legend at the bottom. And you could then share this lithograph. You could send it to possible customers. You could hang it in your home or in your shop. This was often done. This was advertising. And it was a way of announcing the significance of your place, of your community. Bangor had one. Dover had a bird's eye view. And 60 other main places had bird's eye views. If you had one, it was a way of announcing you had arrived, you were significant. And who's creating them? Well, mainly urban artists who travel through the countryside offering to sell them collaborating with local business people who helped to fund them. Monson worked with an outsider, a Boston artist and entrepreneur, to produce locality. It was paying to be a place in 1889. 
So here, again, as with the slate, was a conception of local that didn't require isolation or self-sufficiency, but rather the ability to channel outside flows of capital and culture. One scholar has called this an extroverted sense of place. I like that. How do you make a place? Well, this is an extroverted sense of place. You make a place by weaving together a unique arrangement of outside flows, of capital and culture. This is opposed to an introverted sense of place, where you put up the walls and emphasize what's unique to your place, trying to keep out other influences. And we see something similar in the last development that I want to examine today, and that fourth and final development is rural immigration. Think about an immigrant. If I ask you to imagine an immigrant to the United States in the late 1800s, where is that person? If you imagine an immigrant, where is that immigrant located? Just call out some places. New York City. New York City. Nick. Any Sorry? Any factory. Any factory. Probably based in the city, right? Most of us, I think, associate immigrants with urban areas. Is that fair? So it's worth noting that in 1900, one-third of foreign-born Americans, in 1900, one-third of foreign-born Americans lived in places with fewer than 2,500 residents. A third of foreign-born Americans lived in rural places. The areas with the highest percentages of foreign-born residents were often rural. Millions of immigrants moved to the countryside. The slate quarries drew waves of immigrants to Monson. The Welsh arrived, started arriving in the 1870s. Swedes, like John and Nellie Johnson, settled in large numbers beginning in the 1880s. And Finns showed up in the first decade of the 20th century. Now, rural immigration was distinctive in certain ways, and it presented distinctive challenges to newcomers. One was how to keep up ties with distant family and friends in other parts of the country. Monson immigrants responded to this challenge by using urban print. I'll give you a couple examples. These grieving parents announced the death of their little girl, and this widow announced the death of her husband in a log-driving accident with obituaries in a Chicago-published Swedish-language newspaper. Monson immigrants also wrote in to this newspaper, to which some subscribed, to complain about poor working conditions and low pay in the slate quarries. Even as they cultivated these ties with family and friends and fellow Swedish immigrants in other parts of the country, Monson people transformed their own town. Swedish language advertisements began to appear in the weekly slate. Swedish immigrants constructed a new church building, a Lutheran church in Monson in 1890. It was beautified with Gothic ornamentation that made it look like churches back in Sweden. So Slate reshaped Monson's social landscape as well as its physical landscape. Of the 604 residents in 1870, one was born outside the United States. By 1900 there were 248 foreign-born residents in Monson. Drop in the bucket in a big city, right? 248, not very impressive. But this was a big deal in such a small town. And this is another distinctive feature of rural immigration, and that is the ability of relatively small groups of immigrants to quickly and dramatically alter the texture of local life. By 1900, immigrants formed 22.2% of Monson's population. More than one-fifth of the town was composed of immigrants. 
That was a higher proportion than in Portland, which was Maine's largest city. And it was just under the proportion of foreign-born population in Philadelphia. If you factor in the children of immigrants, one quarter of Monson's population was at most a generation removed from Sweden. Now, such dramatic changes might have been expected to create unease and even backlash, and that was, in fact, the case in some other small towns near Monson. We're going to talk about the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan next week, and you'll see that the Klan was strong in Maine, including in towns like Milo and Dexter, very close to Monson. I think the key reason that Monson immigrants were better treated than many immigrants in other parts of Maine is that unlike Franco-Americans and Irish Americans, Monson immigrants were from Northern Europe. They were Protestant. They were building Lutheran and Methodist churches. And they were eager to assimilate. So the Klan in Maine was mainly an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant group. This beautiful church building, the Lutheran Church, constructed in 1890, still stands in Monson. And the legacy of immigration continues to shape the town. I grew up around people with last names like Burke and Sumi and Erickson. All right, let me wrap it up. We've seen that Monson, like other American rural places during the late 19th century, was well aware of the challenges posed by the growth of cities and that it was quite ingenious in drawing upon urban and even global resources to respond to those challenges. Monson did this by creating new industrial and tourist landscapes, by working with an urban printer to create the town's first local newspaper, and by weaving rural immigrants into the life of the town. A few weeks ago, Kiernan visited during my office hours. I have this image hanging on the wall of my office. We were looking at it. We were talking about Monson. And Kiernan asked a very reasonable question. He said, he asked, does everyone in Monson know everyone else? And my answer to that question is Monson is a small enough place that you could know everyone else. And I say that Because even in a small town, community and local identity and local loyalty do not emerge spontaneously or automatically. They have to be created and recreated continuously. And the thing that has struck me as I've examined Monson's history is that locality is often created by weaving in outside influences. Monson's story continued to be wrapped up with global developments into the 20th century. The slate industry declined. Jobs disappeared. Later in the 1900s, the town entered a period of steep decline, again losing many of its young people, including me. This is a common story, a tragic story, in America's rural areas. But this story, Monson's story, ends with a twist, and that's where I want to end today. Just a few years ago, three years ago, a philanthropic foundation based in southern Maine began working with local people to revive Monson. Over the years, Monson has attracted some very talented, even globally famous artists. Some of them came as summer vacationers. Some became longtime residents. The Libra Foundation, based in southern Maine, is building on that history and spending millions of dollars to renovate buildings in Monson, to create lofts and studios, to establish ties with art schools and set up residency programs and attract artists and art lovers to Monson. This experiment in what's called creative placemaking has even been discussed in the Boston Globe and the New York Times. During all of those hard years as the town really struggled, I could never have imagined that this would happen to my hometown and that it would attract interest from big city newspapers. We started today with Monson celebrating the 50th anniversary of its founding, 
in 1872. Monson is now preparing to celebrate its bicentennial, its 200th anniversary, and once again, local people find themselves debating, discussing how to weave outside influences, the outside world, into their place. That's it for today. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.